Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm a mom, I'm a personal trainer, and me and my husband, we originally joined Steve um, on Patreon back in July during our lockdown. Um, and I'll be honest, we got lost. We didn't know what we was doing. It was hard for us to connect. Um, we came out of that and we've just rejoined back in November um, through his website and we've come uh, and joined the Foundation Discipleship Program as well. So we're re really enjoying that and greatly encouraged. And also uh, been going to the uh, Zoom meetings um, for the last two mornings and being just greatly encouraged by the brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, praying for uh, President Trump's re-election, uh, praying for uh, the revival in, in America and across the world and for Steve's ministry to, uh, to keep growing. So if you've been on the fence thinking whether or not you should join or not, now is a great time. Um, it's a great platform. It's like Facebook, but just with, uh, just with Christians. And uh, there's genuine love and support there. I really feel that. So um, I hope this message blesses you and I hope to see you on a call. One of the benefits you get for being part of Discover Church Online is you have a pastor that you can access and you can ask me questions. I receive your questions and when I can, I answer them to all of our members just because your questions probably are on other people's minds as well. So I got a good question um, not too long ago. Is Jesus God? So we're going to take a few questions today. First one is, is Jesus God? Do we have to believe that Jesus is God? Isn't Jesus just a wonderful teacher? Can we believe that he um, is a wonderful prophet? Why do we have to say that he is God? So, first of all, whenever people ask me this, they usually ask because they have come out of a cult. So just check on that. My first thing isn't always to answer the question that they have for me because it's just superficial. It's a surface symptom of something deeper. So usually people who ask that have come out of a cult, all right, or they're in a cult. Because one thing that is in common with all Christian, so-called Christian cults or Christian heresies is that they deny the deity of Christ. This is something that is considered orthodox, standard Christianity. It's agreed upon in the Nicene Creed, in the Apostles' Creed. It's one of the only things, in fact, that all the Christian three main branches of Christianity, whether it's Western, Eastern, or Protestant, all of them agree on. So it's called, in theology, the hypostatic union. The fact that Jesus is not God or man, he is God and man. It's not an either or. He is uh, he has that hypostatic union or that mystic, uh, mysterious union, all right, mystical union, they might say, in theology. So I'm going to give you today seven proofs that Jesus is God. Seven proofs. Very simple. Uh, these should be very basic, something that you equip yourself with to be able to answer people who are coming out of cults. And the cults are very adamant about this. They'll say, I believe the Bible, we believe the Bible, but we got an extra book. I believe Jesus, but Jesus is not God. All right? So that's a standard you know, telltale sign that you are part of a cult. So first one, is Jesus God? Well, you need to just ask, is Jesus Savior? Is he Savior? Because if he is Savior, he must be God. The scriptures say this, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. So who is the Savior? The living God. In fact, if Jesus were not God, he could not be the Savior. How could one man save seven plus billion people? I mean, we've got seven billion right now. How many other millions and billions of people lived before? How can one man save seven plus billion unless he's infinite, unless he's God? So the substitutionary uh, trade or the sacrifice uh, maybe can happen one for one if you're a man, right? I, I give my life in exchange for another man. I might, if I'm very important, maybe I give my life in exchange for ten men, all right? But how can you, one person, give your life in exchange for all of mankind from Adam until the end? That's just not possible unless he is Savior. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, indeed, the Savior is God. 
Number two, if Jesus was not God, he could not forgive sins. I mean, the Pharisees understood this much. In Luke chapter 5, verse 20, they were lowering down somebody that was sick, right, through a roof because they couldn't get in through the front door. And Jesus saw this in verse 20. And when he saw their faith, he said unto them, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, only God the Creator has the right, only He is entitled to be the judge, to be the person to punish or acquit His own creation. So by virtue of being the Creator, He has the right to assess and review and judge. And so, if He can forgive sin, then He is God. All right. It's very strange, by the way. Just imagine it. Let's say that you got hit on the head by somebody else. All right. That's something that happened between you two. I come in and walk in uh, as a minister and I say, okay, I forgive your sin. The perpetrator, I forgive you know, giving a, a, a big bruise to your head. I forgive your sin. How can I do that? It's between you two. You, as an individual, as a victim, could forgive the sin of the perpetrator. But I, as a third party, can't come in and say, well, I wiped that out. It's like it didn't happen. No, your head is still hurting. You still got the bruise on your head, right? That's what Jesus did. He walked in to other people's situations and said, I forgive your sin. I forgive what, what you did. Only God can do that, and the Pharisees understood that very well. That's the second evidence. Third proof. If Jesus was not God, there would be no offense in his claim. In fact, he could have preached and lived uh, to a ripe old age and nobody would have crucified him. The Pharisees accused him of saying that he said he was God in the flesh. In John chapter 10, verse 31, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Okay, what's his beef? He, he's a nice man. He's, if he's just preaching love, he's, he's healing people nobody would have anything against him. So Christianity must be more than a religion that just preaches love. Because nobody has a problem with that today. There's nothing controversial or even revelatory about that. John chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Verse 33, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. That was the accusation. They said that was a capital crime. You claim that you are God. So it's all throughout the text. It's not something that was made up later by the apostles or by uh, the apostle Paul. In fact, uh, the apostle John testified that Jesus was and is God. So here's the fourth piece of evidence. This is not a later invention. This is not a Pauline doctrine. This is not the gospel according to Paul alone. The disciple that was closest to Jesus, the one that called himself the beloved one, the one that Jesus loved, said this in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Skip down to verse 14. Then he says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, we missed that part. People like full of grace. Remember I said grace is on one side, truth and justice are on the other, other side. Grace and mercy, righteousness, one side, truth and justice on the other side. And what is He full of? Both. We have hidden this Jesus who is full of truth and justice. We've only given the grace and mercy part. But uh, that's an, an aside there. Give you an extra point. Proof number five. Jesus has often appeared in the Old Testament to the Old Testament saints. I know this shocks a lot of people who don't read the Bible. But he did appear because he was alive, he's eternal, and these are called pre-incarnation, pre-incarnate appearances. That means just before he became flesh, he still was around. Now, the Bible is very clear about this. Let's set this up clearly. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 18, and repeat it in 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, 
No one has seen God at any time. Okay, you hear that? John said, no one has seen God at any time. And yet, of course, he just said, and the word of God, God became flesh and we beheld him, we touched him, we saw him, we heard him, and we recognized his glory. Well, that's either a contradiction or it's an indication that there's more than one person in the Godhead. All right, But let's take a look at the Old Testament, because the Old Testament sets everything up. When you start out in Genesis chapter 1, all right, in the beginning, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You know that word God? There's a grammatical error there. And the Bible sets it up from the beginning that there's a trinity. The word God is Elohim. And then created and the rest of the verbs for the rest of the Bible, whenever Elohim appears to, and designating God, the verb is a mismatch. The noun is plural, the verb is singular. Makes no grammatical sense, but it makes sense that if there is one God who is a trinity, he is one God expressed in three persons, that's why he's Elohim. Not Eloah, the singular, but Elohim, the plural. So we have an indication of the trinity from the beginning. It's not an invention of Christians or Christianity. Then Abraham testifies to this. In Genesis chapter 15, we find that he meets God. Verse 1, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Of course, no angel would say that. No angel has ever appeared and said, I'm great and I'm your reward. No, only God can say that. Skip down to verse 5, And he, this is the Lord, brought him, Abram, outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Verse 6, And he, Abram, believed who? Believed the Lord. So he's talking to someone that he can see who's taking him outside to look at stars, and then he says he believed that person that he was with. He believed the Lord. And he, the Lord, counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. Again, the Bible is very clear. No one has seen God any time. You see God, you would die. God's full of glory. The presence of the Father would, would strike down a sinner. You cannot stand in his presence. No one has seen God. Yet, Abraham talked to God face to face. So either there's a contradiction in the Bible or it's an indication that there's more than one person in the Godhead. And Abraham would have seen Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus claims later. So this is Genesis 15, 4,000 years ago that it was written. And Jesus comes and he says, yep, that was me. I was the one Abraham was talking to. We'll get to that in a second. Who else saw uh, God in the Old Testament? Many, of course, but let's take one more example, just to be brief. Genesis 16, the next chapter. The angel of the Lord. Now, when you see the angel of the Lord, people think of cupids flying with wings. The word angel just means messenger. So it could mean an angel, like an angelic being uh, in the class of creation, or sometimes it is actually the Lord himself. And the context will tell you, the language of that story will tell you. Just read uh, on further and you'll see, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Okay, so this is the story of Hagar. Hagar sees God because she's run away from Sarah. Sarah was, was hard on her, was rough on her, and she said, well, forget this. I don't need to serve a master who's so rough. And what did the Lord say? Go back and submit to her. So that's what submission is. When you disagree, when you think someone's wrong, but yet you obey, all right? yet you continue to serve. That's called submission, and God calls all of us to submit to someone somewhere. And oftentimes it's not going to be fair all the time, but the attitude of a godly person is to be submissive. So the angel of the Lord said, go and submit. And then he said, here's the reward, verse 10. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring. Wait. Who's going to multiply your offspring? Can a created angel do that? No. No angel, no demon can make offsprings for you. All right. 
So I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. Now what angel has the power over life and can determine the future? Well, there's no such angel. Verse 13, so she's aware of this. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Hagar recognized that she was speaking to God. So Hagar saw God, and no one has seen God at any time. So either there's a contradiction or there's more than one person in the Godhead. Who did Hagar see? She saw Jesus, the pre-incarnate manifestation of God uh, through the Son is Jesus Christ. And Jesus came many, many times in the Old Testament. Now, this is what all cults, all false religions deny. So one of the greatest sins for uh, religion in the Middle East, the religion of Islam, uh, they call it blasphemy. They call it the highest of all sins to say that Jesus is God in the flesh. The Bible actually says, who would deny that Jesus is God in the flesh, come in the flesh, but Antichrist? All right, so that's an interesting indication there. All right, six, six proof. All right, evidence number six. Jesus made a point several times that he existed before he came to earth 2,000 years ago. All right, he existed, he was around long, long before he was incarnated as a baby in the Virgin Mary. And I think it can't be any more clear than John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Right again, if, if you are part of a cult that has taught you that Jesus is not God, you can now see that this is totally unraveling through so many multitudes of scriptures. Please compare what you believe with the scriptures. Right? We are basing our eternal destiny on what the Word of God says, not what some other man says. So the Word of God says in John chapter 8, and this is the New King James. Verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Well, how could Abraham have seen Jesus unless Jesus is God, is eternal? The Jews understood this. Verse 57, Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? How dare you, is what they're saying. 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Wow. And when he said that, I mean, they knew exactly, I am is the great title. I am that I am is how God introduced himself to, to Moses and to Israel. Who, who do I say sent me to you? Moses asked. And, and God says, tell him, I am. I am. That's all you need to say. I am. I'm the eternal one. Not I was, not I will be. I am. And that's exactly what uh, Jesus said. Before Abraham was, I am. Verse 59, they weren't pleased with this. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Uh, this, this was not throwing stones to play with him. This was throwing stones to kill him. What would drive religious people so murderously angry? Because Jesus made a claim over and over that he's more than a prophet, more than a teacher, more than a nice guy, more than a founder of some new religion. No, he's the originator. He's the original. He's the creator. And he came down on earth to talk to us and to deal with us. We have a great problem with God, our sins. And he said, I'm going to deal with that and I'll come down myself. So we have a, a faith like no other faith. There's no other religion, no other philosophy, no other faith like Christianity. It is the truth. It is the truth in the background, in the foreground, in the past, in the present, in the future. It is the truth about who created us and He loved us so much He didn't leave us in our sins. He came down to pay for our sins. So we don't accept this gift. We're hopeless. We have no other way to get to heaven or to have an eternity free from the punishment that sin deserves. All right, now there's another uh, example of this. And Jesus showed it, actually. Jesus showed that there was a, a time sequence contradiction, time sequence contradiction in some Messianic prophecies 
which indicate that the Messiah is eternal. In this one instance I'll raise, the Sadducees came and they asked him a trick question. They said, uh, who's going to be married to whom in the resurrection? So the Pharisees didn't believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees, sorry, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection. So the Sadducees want to say, look how, how uh, they don't believe the resurrection makes any sense. Because they said, well, who's going to be married to whom in the resurrection? And then they gave the example, a woman married seven men. Okay, because all the seven men died, you know, I guess quickly one after the other. So whose wife will she be? Well, Jesus answers this adeptly, very easily. And in verse 39, then some of the scribes, I guess not all, some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have well spoken. All right. And so then Jesus said, okay, my turn. I want to ask you a very hard question. So let's pick this up in Luke chapter 20, verse 41. Jesus speaking. And he said to them, How can they say that the Christ is the son of David? his son of David that speaks of his humanity. Now David himself said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. The Lord said to my Lord indicates deity. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David calls him Lord, deity. How is he then his son, which is humanity? You see there's the hypostatic union in that there's a problem with the time sequence. Clearly, everyone agrees this is a prophecy about the Messiah, right? the coming Messiah. Who's he going to be? He's going to be a son of David. That means he issues out of David. And yet David says, this person is the one that the Lord God called my Lord. How is that possible? The Lord pre-existed David, and yet this person comes out of David. How can he be both? That's the hypostatic union. He's both God and he's man. This is the amazing thing about Jesus. There's no one like him. You either believe him and get saved, or you're believing the wrong guy. You're believing the wrong person. You know why? Because you're believing someone less. If you want someone to save you, you go right to the top. Hallelujah. All right, so I said I'll give you seven proofs. Here's the last one, seven proofs. The seventh one is just the fact that there are many, 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 many scriptures that proclaim the hypostatic union. That is the union of the deity and the humanity of the Messiah in one person. Let's just take uh, something similar to Luke 20. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10, from the King James, it says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand up for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. So it says, in that day in the future is, come one, is coming someone who even the Gentiles are going to seek. And who is he? Oh, he is the root of Jesse. Well, wait a second, that goes all the way back. It, 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 David is here. Jesse is his father. The root of Jesse has to be someone who created Jesse, either an ancestor or the creator himself. So someone from the past is coming into your future to be the Savior. That's the hypostatic union. It's not only union of God and man, it's union of finite and infinite. Right? I know I'm mispronouncing that, but the infinite with the finite. It's the union of someone from the past with someone from the future. How is that possible? That's Jesus. Wow, He's worthy. Glory to Jesus. He is worthy of all praise. He is not like anyone else. He is unique. He is supreme. Glory, 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 glory to God. Okay, Isaiah chapter 9. I'll give you two more, right? I think it's pretty clear that Jesus is God. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. There's the hypostatic union. A child is born refers to his humanity. Humanity can be born. But also unto us a son is given. Meaning what? God cannot be born. He can only be given. The Son of God was given from heaven the hypostatic union, pre-existent, always eternally existent, and yet born and died. How can both be true in the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ? Who is this person? The, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Well, a lot of people believe that. Jesus is Wonderful. Counselor, a lot of people believe that as well. But the next one says, The Mighty God. 
Well, there's no way you can fudge that. There's no cult that can erase that Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It's not something made up in the New Testament. It's not something made up by Christians. The Jews have it in their Bible. It's a prophecy. The Messiah is called by one of his titles, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and of course, the Prince of Peace. So you can't have him as wonderful and the Prince of Peace without also believing he's the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. All right? And we'll come now to the New Testament. We used a lot of Old Testament just to prove it to you that it's not made up. It's always been the revelation of the Word of God. But by the time you get to the book of Hebrews, it's pretty, pretty clear. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, I'm going to take a really easy translation now. We did a lot of King James. Let's do the New English translation. Verse 2, in these days, I hope you're enjoying this, in these days he has spoken to us in a son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created the world. So who's the Son? The one through whom he created the world. So he existed how many thousands or millions of years ago? Verse 3, the Son is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence. And he sustains all things by his powerful word, and so when he had accomplished cleansing from sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thus he became so far better than the angels, as he has inherited a name superior to theirs. Verse 8, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God. Of the Son, God the Father says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and a righteous scepter, is the scepter of your kingdom. So you can hear at least two people talking to each other. The Father says, Son, He addresses the Son as, O oh God, your throne is forever. There's two, two persons there, and yet they're one God. Your throne is forever and ever. He's eternal. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. And a righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. Verse 10, And you founded the earth in the beginning, Lord, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Wow. Imagine God the Father says that. Heaven. You created heaven. Oh Lord Jesus. Oh, how powerful is he? They will perish. He says even the heavens will perish. But you continue. They will grow old like a garment. And like a robe you will fold them up and like a garment they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will never run out. That's the eternal God the all-powerful God. And this whole chapter, Hebrews chapter 1, is just the introduction to who is Jesus. And what's great about Hebrews is, is written by Paul. And this is what the early church fathers said. At least three of them said that, and I believe that. Some people don't believe it. It's fine. But I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, and what he's trying to do is he wrote it to the Hebrews. Many people believe it's actually written in Hebrew. It was later then translated back into Greek. And he's trying to tell the Jews, who at this time didn't have all of the New Testament, said, if you just study the Old Testament, you'd get this. How is it that you've studied all of the Old Testament and you don't understand who Jesus is? You don't understand the hypostatic union. You don't understand the prophecy that the Messiah must be God. Far above prophets, far above teachers, far above angels, far above everything else that you think is supernatural. He's God. You know, if Jesus is not God, He can't be your Savior. And if he's not your savior, you're going to hell because of your sins. So you must believe. It is a standard orthodox belief of Christianity that Jesus is God, all-powerful, infinite, and sinless. And he alone can save me and the rest of humanity. Without believing that, I don't think there's a way that you can truly be a Christian whose sins are, are forgiven and you're saved and your name is written in the book of life. So I believe that if you would just accept Jesus, if you're not yet Christian and this is the first time you heard this, praise God, congratulations. It's not about going to church and it's not about putting down what you learned before. It's great what you learned before, but now you know that one missing piece in order to be saved, for your life to be transformed. You must say with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is God and He's the Savior. So I would say that right now. If you're not yet a Christian, if your life is kind of in the pits right now, you're confused, uh, you know that you have sins that are going to be punished on the day of judgment, 
why don't you say with your mouth right now, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that you are God and Savior. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sins and all the sins of the world. I accept you as my God, my King, my Savior. Come into my heart. Wash me of all my sins. Thank you, Lord, for dying and rising again from the dead. Thank you for saving me. Be with me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's what we all prayed in order to be born again. It's very simple. You can pray it in a different way, but in some way you must acknowledge the deity of Jesus Christ and the great work he did like no one else. He's the only sinless person who can wash away your sins. And you'll feel it in your heart. If you ask him to forgive you, that's exactly what he'll do. But the, the forgiveness is not cheap. It's paid for by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. All right, so today you've heard me answer one of the questions from one of my online church members. If you'd like to hear other ones, all right, which I'm going to tackle uh, throughout, you know, throughout the year, please join discoverchurch.online. It's a great community. It's a very low subscription fee. You can choose any of the three and you'll be part of a community that is serious about growing spiritually. And we're not just, you know, playing church. We're not doing like I guess so many other people do. I, I don't want to comment too much, but if you want to be part of a church community that is not pew warmers, that are not lukewarm, but are real serious committed Christians, we're preparing our, ourselves and our friends for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We want to be ready for His coming and we want to be biblically balanced. We want to be found faithful when He returns. Then you found the right place, discoverchurch.online. Go and check it out and I'll meet you over there. 